That was good playing this morning, Kath. The one song that we sang reminded me of the little story of the of the little lady who uh, she had come to know the Lord and trusted the Savior. Uh, her life had been changed, and she was growing to know Him better. But she she had some problems and. Um, some chemical imbalances, and sometimes she would see things that weren't there. And <clears throat> she came to her pastor one day, an elderly pastor, and she she said to him, "Pastor, I, I need your prayers for me, because for months now these same two individuals have been following me. And though I've never really seen them, I just sense that they're there." And I go out to get some groceries, or I go to the post office, I go places, and I sense that they're there, and I'm just afraid. And the pastor, understanding her condition, he said, why do you know who they are? And she said, well, no, I I don't. And he said, well, they're not out to hurt you. Psalm 23 says, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And her eyes lit up, and her countenance changed, and she began to enjoy the fact that they were following her. And um, it was just his way of lovingly consoling her in her fears and concerns. Aren't you glad that goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life? Boy, I am. Well, you can return if you would. We don't have anything on the screen for you today, so you're going to have to break open your Bibles and have them on your laps or your cell phone edition or whatever it is you have there. We're back in Acts chapter 4. I read some some time back that skilled animal trainers for years have have been able to train some of the mightiest animals on the earth. And they have done so with a very simple method. For instance, the mighty African elephant is trained to stay in place and to be restrained and immobilized simply by a small chain around one huge foot and a small stake driven into the dirt nearby. And as the elephant grows and matures into the mighty creature that God made it to be, for the whole of its life thereafter, whenever chained, it stays in place. Not because it cannot move, Effortlessly, it could pull the stake and take off. But it stays there because it's bound by memory and by conditioning. We're living in a time just like the first century. Whether we lived in the first century as Christians and believers, or whether we live in the 21st century, it's the same. The same message that God has given us to share with others has not changed. Man's condition in his lost estate, apart from God, is in the same predicament. The world and its offense and hostility toward the gospel has not changed. Really, nothing has changed. The world and culture in which we live seeks to drive a little stake and a little chain around the ankle of the church and condition the church through through the world's unbelief and intimidation to limit us, to silence us, to muzzle us, if you will, when we carry with us the most liberating, life-changing message the world has ever known or will ever know the message of the gospel. We celebrate around the 4th of July our emancipation, our liberty, 
but there's a greater liberty. There's a far greater liberty. There is a freedom that we need that is greater than any social liberty. It's greater than any financial liberty. It's greater than any cultural liberty. It's greater than even any physical or medical liberty. It's the liberty of the soul, the freeing of the soul through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have this message. How does the local church break from her bondage to memory and conditioning when our culture tells us to muzzle it, privatize it, keep it among yourselves, but don't bring it out into the marketplace. Don't bring it to Walmart with you. Don't bring it to the drugstore with you. Don't bring it to the post office with you. Don't interact with colleagues at work about these things. Keep quiet about those things. That's, that's your private um, engagement. Well, the first century church, that was unthinkable to them. And it had only been a short time since these apostles that we're looking at today had literally spent three years, three and a half years with Christ. He told them repeatedly that he was going to the cross and that he would die and rise again, which was hard to compute, hard to grasp. It almost ricocheted off. It's as though they just couldn't take that part of the message in. But the time came when Christ would bear our sins to the cross and, and place himself in submission both to the will of evil men who wanted rid of him, but also to the will of his Father who sent him to carry out that very work. And we know the story of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. And not only that, but then he began to appear. And for 40 days he appeared to his own and to his disciples, giving them further instruction that they were to take this message to the world. Has that changed? No. But the world would silence us and the world would muzzle us, and the world would tamp a little stake with a small chain around the ankle of God's people and say, stay here and no further. You know, the real question is not, what do people want in a church? It's really not a very consequential question, even though there are a lot of churches today that that's how they build their church. They want to find out what people want, and then they give them what they want. And so they have their light shows and s smoke machines and uh, it's a big theatrical presentation and they have lots of entertainment and they have all the stuff to draw people in. And that's great if you want a church full of goats and not sheep. No, the real question is what does God himself want in his church and through his people? That's the question, isn't it? What kind of church has God blessed? What kind of church does God's power rest upon? Well, it's the kind of church that we have here in Acts chapter 4. As we look at this, what I want you to see is the response. We've already read the context. They... Uh, they had imprisoned Peter and John. And now they've told them, no more are you to speak in this name. But they had nothing to charge them with, and so they released them. And so they came back to their church. I wonder what would happen this morning if, if you were all here waiting for me to arrive, and then I show up right now, late, and I come in, and I look a little uh, shaken and a little unkept, and you can tell maybe I had a sleepless night, and... Uh, I got up here and told you all that they came to my home because they'd heard that I was preaching the gospel and I was taken to the county jail last night, thrown in jail, um, 
warned and threatened and so on, and then I was released and told that I'm no longer to preach or teach in the name of Jesus Christ. What would we all do? Would we board up the place? Would we throw in the towel? Shall I be silent? Well, what, how did the church respond in Acts chapter 4? Well, there are several responses, and, and I take it that, I've put it this way, what we need is what the first century church had. And, that, and we do in many ways, but we always need to stoke that fire and then challenge one another toward greater heights. But these people were marked by an elevation that wasn't of this world. They were elevated spiritually because they were in union with Christ and they had their marching orders and they knew that they were to win their world to Christ. And the odds were totally against them. There's no doubt about it. From the Roman officials, from the Jewish officials, and even the common people, there was hostility. And yet... That's the world our Lord called us to spread the good news because he has those that he wants to draw to himself and they need to hear it. So a elevated, lofty, if you will, a expansive, a high view of several things. The first that I want you to see is that these believers in the first century had a high view of the greatness of, of God himself. Their God was not small. He was lofty. He was magnificent. He was the true and living God of all creation. And so when we look there at verse 23 and 24, look at how they responded. When they had been released, Peter and John, and they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard this, they said, well, let's stockpile some food and go into seclusion. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it says they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. The first thing they did was look upward. And they said, are you kidding? They're telling us not to talk about you. They're telling us to be quiet about you. How can we be quiet when the heavens are telling of the glory of God? You know, Psalm 19 says, begins with the heavens, speaking of creation. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Do you know what that's really saying? Little puny Tony, who is nothing on the whole scheme, in the whole scheme of things, nothing. I get to stand behind this little wooden pulpit for over 30 years and preach God's word, when while I'm doing that, God says in his own word that my heavens, the heavens is my pulpit. And I am proclaiming who I am day and night. Night unto night shows his wisdom. Day unto day reflects his power and his glory. And the seraphs that, that beheld the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, they said the whole earth is full of his glory. So I get my little pulpit, and God's pulpit is the universe. And he speaks through creation to man. And he's not listening. And that's why little puny men like me have to remind us to unstop our ears. My brother-in-law spent six weeks in the hospital. And he had only been out just a few days when Kathy and I went to visit a few weeks ago. But one of the things that happened to him while in the hospital was he had wax build up in his ears and it got to the point where his balance was being affected. He felt a little disoriented 
And at some point, they completely clogged, and he couldn't hear anything. And uh, Dr. Tony, I said, well, maybe there's something we can do. Let me run down to Walgreens and see what they have to say. And so I went down and talked to the pharmacist, and he said, go over to the ear section. So <laughs> I went to the ear section and meandered around it. But they had this little kit, and this, and all this is a little squirt bottle with a little soft little uh, deal on the end of the squirt thing, and you fill it with, first you put some drips uh, in the ears that's a solvent that sort of softens the wax, and then you take warm water and you spray it. And we went through three bottles on each ear. And each time we got to the point, you'd have had to been there to appreciate this. And, and Ken, you know, Ken's feeling, he's not quite himself yet, six weeks in the hospital with kidneys that are shut down. Anyway, he was there and leaning over in the easy chair and I had a towel around him and I was squirting on it. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a little cup that catches it and I'd get a little residue here and there, and then I'd go fill the bottle, and after the third time, the big cork of wax dropped out into it, and as soon as it did, he just began laughing, and he was so happy and just joyful because all of a sudden, for the first time in weeks, he could hear. And so it was just this wonderful experience, and so I did the other ear, and sure enough, it took the same amount on the third bottle, we got it out, and uh, he could hear. And I don't know why they didn't do that for him at the hospital. I, they didn't have me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but that little gadget works, so there's my advertisement for you in case you have that problem. But why am I here? Well, I'm like that little bottle. Week after week, why do we preach? Why do we witness? What, when you witness to somebody, what are you trying to do? You're hoping God will use you to open their ears because the whole universe is God's pulpit. He's proclaiming his glory day after day after day of his greatness and magnificence. Oh, Lord, they look up and say, hey, Lord, they're telling us to be quiet. Are you kidding a high view, an elevated view of the greatness of God. Secondly, in verses 25 through 28, these believers in the first century had a lofty view of the written word of God, of, of the scriptures themselves, and the, and the veracity and truthfulness and trustworthiness of the scriptures. So look there at verse um, 25. After saying, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, now they're quoting Psalm 2, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? And the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Everyone was against him. In verse 28, they gathered and conspired to do what? To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Who was really in charge of it all? God was. They carried out with their evil hands, with their cruel hands, with their vicious, vicious hearts. They killed the Son of God. They, they crucified him. And yet they were carrying out the sovereign, predetermined purpose of God. They have a high view you see, you would, that could have just rocked those early Christians. Can you imagine? They got over on him. They've destroyed him. But no, they not only knew that he had given himself on the cross, bearing our guilt, our sins, 
but he, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He plundered the grave. Has Christ plundered the grave on your behalf? Scripture says he has, if you'll trust in him. He plundered the grave. He, he spoiled hell's designs. He conquered death and rose triumphant the third day. Christ fulfilled the word of God, the scriptures. So these people had a high view of God's greatness, but they also had a lofty view, a reverent view of the truthfulness of God's written word. Number three, in verses 29 through 30, we also see that they had a a high and lofty view of the very gospel of God. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. I love this. I just love this boldness. Lord, we have this note. We have this note from the rulers, and they tell us we can't talk about you anymore. We can't tell others about you and the good news of what you've accomplished and what you've done. Lord, would you take note of their threats? <laughs> Don't you love that? Couldn't we, use a, a, couldn't we use a good helping of that kind of boldness ourselves? After all, the messenger isn't the issue. It's the message that's so powerful. It's the truth that sets men free. And so, verse 20, 29, and now, Lord, and, and, and do, you, do you, there's a sense in which the presence of God is right here with these people. With one accord, they lifted their voice, and they turned to him and they say, and now, Lord, not like we're sending a long-distance telegram hoping to hear back for, for in a few months. No, it was now, Lord, right now, consider their threats. How present tense is the very presence of God with his people. And so verse 29, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may be kept safe and and protected and and uh, secluded and and comforted and right no that's not what it says it says grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus the gospel, the saving power and gospel that we are called to share with others. It, 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 I think it would be so liberating for us all if we could just realize it isn't about us. It's not about us. It's not about the messenger. It's about the message. And of course, we're part of that message because we're not merely advocates. And here's the difference. If you get nothing else out of this today, think about the distinction between being an advocate. If I was a, uh, a, um, an attorney and I worked for the county and you got into some trouble and I'm your attorney, court, appoint, court appointed attorney, and I come in and I set my briefcase down and I open it up and I have a half a dozen or more files. Let's see, where are you? Let's see, okay, here you are. I throw it open, I read a little bit. Oh, okay, I see, you have a DUI here and it's your second one. And I, I, I read this over and so I'm gonna stand up and try to make an appeal to the judge and try to get the charges dropped. And what am I doing? I'm being an advocate on your behalf. That is not what these people were. They were not advocates. These people were witnesses. And that's why earlier in the chapter when we read it, Peter said, 
You decide whether we should obey you or obey God. But we cannot stop speaking of what we have seen and heard. What's, what was Peter saying? He was saying, we're not just advocates. We are witnesses, personal, experienced witnesses whose lives have been changed by the power of the gospel. That's what folks need from us. I have this little card hanging over my little study desk at home. And it says on it, and I can't remember who it was. It may have been George Whitfield. I don't know who it was, but he said, to be God's witness effectively in sharing with others, you must know what you believe. And you must, secondly, believe what you believe. And thirdly, feel what you know you believe and trust in. And I remember the story of, I think it was Ben Franklin, who was seen going to a meeting where George Whitfield was preaching. And somebody stopped him on the way in and said, wait a minute, uh, Mr. Franklin, why are you here? Everyone knows you're not a believer. And Ben Franklin said, yes, you're right, young man. I'm not a believer. But George Whitfield is. And I want to hear him. You see, it was something about not merely being an advocate, but being a witness who was sharing what he believed and felt. And Whitfield always did that shared with passion with others and concern and love for them. Well, so they had this high view of God's greatness, God's word, and God's gospel. But they also had a high view, a lofty, elevated view of the access that they had to God. And you can see that there in verse 31. It says there that when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now you notice it doesn't say Peter and John began to speak God's word with boldness. They were all of one accord. They were filled with the Spirit of God. And God sent them out to bear witness with boldness. So it was all of them. Is it possible that all of us, me included, couldn't use a dose of boldness these days? Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. They went forth and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Well, we're, we're running short of time, and I know I'm, I need to finish up. The last one I want you to see, which is quite beautiful, and we all appreciate it, is that they had a high value, a high view, and appreciation for the family of God, for being connected with fellow believers. You see that in verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Now, who could do that? Who could do that? I mean, even just take our little country church. It would be fun to just march us across and have us share in five minutes where we're from, where we grew up, what kind of life we grew up with. We would all find how different, what a mix we are. And I'm sure it was in many ways the same in the first century. And yet it says here that the congregation of those who believed, because of their connection with Jesus Christ through faith, they were as one uh, heart and one soul. And then it goes on to say in verse 33, And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. So they had this connection with each other. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you what? 
if you, if you bite and argue and undercut one another, right? No. If you have love for one another, a godly love and concern. Yesterday, I just out of the blue, uh, I look up and Robbie Fisher and, and um, Colton came by our house and, and here's Robbie out at, behind my garage emptying my big bin with, with, that has grass clippings and leaves and out there standing on his prosthetic leg with a pitchfork filling the back of his truck with all my slash so he could haul it away. And um, the thing is, is this. Yes, that met a practical need. And yes, I, it was getting overloaded and I needed to haul it off. But really what that was all about was a symbol. It was a symbol and a picture of a brother loving another brother. And I went out to thank Rob and express my appreciation. And you know, Robbie, he kind of laughed it off and said, well, it's become a tradition and I enjoy doing it. And I wouldn't feel right now if I didn't swing by and, and he has a hole out on his place he can dump it. And but Rob, I really appreciated it. And thank God for you and your family and the work that the Lord's doing in your family. Nice to, what's that? <laughs> yeah. You don't have to steal them. Just, just take them when you want them. Well, isn't that a great chapter? It's just it's so rich. And, uh, but from time to time, we just need to be told that it's okay to say, Lord, consider their threats. Take note of their opposition. And, and I'm not concerned about you, Lord, toning them down but tune me up because you have some people even among the most opposed who one day are going to hear that there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved a, a negative denial there is no other name and a positive assertion by which we must be saved. And that's, that's, this is where we are, guys, in this crazy world of ours, with social media and a, and a big mixed fruit bowl of ideas and concepts and philosophies and various religions sort of blended in together like a witch's cauldron. It's, it's just all over the place on every side, and yet here we are, and for our protection, Jesus said to us, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And, and many are those who go down that path. But the gate is narrow. And the road is narrow that leads to life. And few are they that find it. And if you are among the few, who found that narrow gate of faith in Jesus Christ, in his perfect work, if you trust in him, oh, how grateful you should be. You're among the few. See, the Bible is honest with us. I guess from one point of view, you could say, well, you know, if Christianity and the truth of the gospel was true, there should be people flocking to it. That's not what the Lord said. He said, few are they that find it. Are you among the few who've put your trust and your faith in Christ? Are you? I hope you are. Well, let's stand and thank the Lord for today. And by the way, as you're standing, I, I want to remind you, next Saturday, next Saturday at 1, one o'clock, is it 1 or 11? At 1 o'clock, uh, I know it might have been up above, but, but just a reminder to everyone, Colleen um, Lewin, uh, Terry's mom, you went home to be with the Lord a while back, and uh, timing has now come, and we're able to have a special tribute and memorial service to Colleen and her life and with her family, and um, she was with us for a year or so, as far as attendance goes. She was here longer than that, but because of COVID, she couldn't be here, but... 
but I know, um, I think, Terry, we're anticipating a special service for your mom and looking forward to that. And, and I wonder, I wonder, don't you wonder sometimes? Were we to ask Colleen, Colleen, um, should we be a little bolder? What do you think she'd say? Now that she sees what she sees, hears what she hears, feels what she feels, is encompassed in the presence of God's glory. Eyes like no other. I think she'd say, run well. Run your race well. Well, let's pray and thank the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this tremendous chapter from your word. Thank you for recording this history for us. Thank you for the boldness of the early church and for the high view they had of you and of your greatness and of your written word, of the gospel of God and of the love they had for each other as fellow believers. And so, Lord, we pray that just what you would have for each of us from this text May you sow it in our hearts and lead us into this week and grant us opportunities uh, to, to speak more freely, more winsomely, more joyfully, and to, be, and to remember that as those who have experienced your power and grace and forgiveness, we're not merely advocates. We're witnesses, witnesses of a God who has changed us and made us different deep inside. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness, and thank you for the grace that sustains us every day of our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We are dismissed.